yeah, I am Alexander Dante Camuto, uh, known to some as Alex or Dante, depending on the context. Uh, and I am the former CEO of the entity formerly known as Mile, <laughs> and am now part of the Retrieval Markets Lab, uh, led by Patrick. So this is more of a retrospective talk on uh, <laughs> of what we were doing over the past year uh, prior to joining Protocol Labs. So I assume all of you are fa fairly familiar with what a DCDN and what a retrieval market is at this point. Uh, so I'm going to dive right in. Uh, so some of the constraints we imposed when we were designing Mile, uh, maybe somewhat foolishly, uh, were first to be unopinionated about the kind of peer that could join the network, uh, which means we would make no claim as to, or enforce no constraints as to the capabilities of peers that would join the network. Uh, the second constraint was that we needed to enable peer peer to peer connections. So browsers would need to be able to connect directly to caches without relying on HTTP gateways. Um, so those first two, uh, constraints, you know, there's a whole host of literature on how to deal with that, you know, coming from the torrenting world. Uh, but the third constraint was uh, to be interoperable with some of the foremost storage networks, uh, decentralized storage networks specifically that exist today, and that imposes a whole host of other constraints, particularly in terms of what kinds of data transfer protocols you can use or how you can represent your data. Um, so yeah, a core piece of the network was what we called a POP, just a point of presence, which is classic uh, content delivery network terminology. Um, and these CDN building blocks basically were capable or are still capable of four things. Uh, so the first is that they are able to dispatch content to other caches. So let's say a node is completely overwhelmed and is getting lots of requests, they can dispatch content to neighboring nodes to help lessen uh, the request load that they're getting. The second is that a node should be capable of discovering uh, which nodes have which content. This is the discovery module within the node. The third is that they should be able to deliver content to requesting peers. And the fourth is that they are able to both accept and issue payments uh, for content that they receive. Um, so when we started the year, our network architecture was as follows. So <laughs> somewhat betraying our uh, you know, decentralized ethos, we had <laughs> content indexing and routing hosted on Cloudflare. So we had a key value store sort of indexing which nodes held which piece of content, and a client that wanted to find that piece of content would then query that Cloudflare key value store to, to then fetch the content. Um, in many decentralized or peer-to-peer -peer networks, you need bootstrap nodes, uh, which enable you to connect to other nodes in the network. So these were provided by POP nodes with public IPs. Um, content delivery also supplied by POP nodes, um, but we also wanted the ability for browsers to be able to fetch content directly uh, you know, from nodes on the network, and that was the JS implementation of our POP node. And I'll run through all of this in a bit more detail. Um, and the in-browser content, as I said, you know, we're trying, we're aspiring to have no gateways. We want the browsers to connect directly to nodes, um, but we could only do a retrieval um, with this client. Oh, that showed up. <laughs> Was not expecting that. Um, yeah, so uh, there were four. There's four core modules to a Go Pop node. Um, the first, and they're all kind of leveraging the protocol labs and Filecoin stack um, and various capabilities. So at the networking layer, you know, we're leveraging lib P2P and a DHT for peer discovery. Uh, our data is represented using IPLD and Unix FS. For storing that data, we're using, you know, the data store implementation with Badger in the back end. And for data exchange, we're using the GraphSync protocol. The reason we chose this is that we wanted to be able to cache miss eventually to storage providers, um, which is something that we haven't done yet. And then for payments, which is also tightly coupled with the data exchange protocol, we used Filecoin payment channels. 
And what I mean by tightly coupled with the data exchange protocol is that you needed to be able to incrementally verify data that you were receiving and then in turn issue micropayments for each little piece of data that you had verified, so the person that had provided you with the data. And as promised, the in-browser client is just a stripped down version of the previous node. We've got lippy 2 we've got an IPLD data representation and the same uh, data exchange protocol. Um, but it can run in a service worker or a Cloudflare worker. Um, the problem when we were designing this is that GraphSync did not exist for, or there was no reference implementation for GraphSync in JavaScript, so we had to go do that. Please go check it out. Use it if you, <laughs> if you really want to. We only got six stars. We should be getting more. <laughs> All right, moving on. There's a whole host of problems with this setup. So we've got Go nodes and we've got clients in JS. Um, there's some issues with performance when using JS lib P2P, um, one of which is that because browsers need to use TLS to connect to nodes, you're both encrypting with TLS plus what's called noise encryption, which is another encryption protocol used in lib P2P, and that slows everything down a lot. So even when fetching content locally, so we had one JS node and one Go node, and when fetching content in that setup, we were maxing out at 30 megabytes per second. So even if you wanted to fetch content from a really, really, really good peer on the network, you couldn't do so um, because the implementation or your networking layer plus our implementation of GraphSync would just not enable you to do that. The other problem is that our development efforts were being split across two repos and two languages, which is not so great. And we were also imposing a client-server architecture. So the browsers couldn't serve data to other peers, and we were introducing lots of asymmetry into the network. I won't go into race conditions and go. <laughs> so what are potential solutions to this problem? So like lots of people in 2022, we were um, flirting with Rust. Um, <laughs> and it turns out we really, really liked it. Um, <laughs> so facing similar issues to JS, you know, there was no reference implementation uh, for GraphSync and Rust. And, you know, we really, really love GraphSync. So we have another implementation of GraphSync and Rust. Please also try this one out. It has a similar number of stars. Um, <laughs> uh, all right. So. The performance in Rust is actually already improving on some of the performance we had previously. So the Rust transfer speeds, uh, you know, testing locally, we're maxing out at 400 megabytes per second. So this is just doing transfers between two Rust pop nodes. Um, and in Wasm, which could potentially be used in a browser, we had doubled on the performance in JavaScript, which is pretty cool. It's not, it's not amazing, but it's already better than what we had previously. And it's all done with a single repo. Um, yeah. Some other work that we did in Rust as part of the implementation of the point of presence in Rust is, um, I guess, sort of inspired by the Filecoin indexer and aiming to replace that Cloudflare key value store that I introduced at the beginning. Uh, we wanted to roll out sort of a decentralized uh, indexing system, um, sort of inspired by how Filecoin indexers currently work. Uh, you store an index as what's called a HAMPT or hashed array map try. And you know, new nodes on the network when they receive content publish updates to those indices and those indexes can get synced across indexing nodes. Anyway, the problem, okay, so we've sort of addressed some of the local performance issues, um, which means that if we connect to a good peer with good uplink and we have good downlink, maybe we can get a file fast. Um, but that's not always the case. Um, and we kind of need to accommodate for uneven performance of peers on the network. And this is, you know, a problem that torrenting networks faced. And the way they typically solved it is by enabling um, multi-peer data exchange protocols. So you need to be able to fetch pieces of content from many peers in parallel. Um, and that is how you can kind of integrate out the badly performing peers on the network. Uh, there's some issues, particularly uh, when using DAGs to represent your data, uh, which kind of make this difficult. If you have questions about that, we can talk about it later. Um, 
And yeah, unfortunately, you know, Juan in his opening talk said not to do compute and retrieval at the same time, um, <laughs> but we've done both. Um, and we've been running experiments in, um, in conjunction with the electric coin company uh, responsible for Zcash and some friends out of Penn State University who are professors there uh, and trustless and decentralized compute. So what have we built? Um, so we've built this command line tool called EasyKL, um, which enables you to turn any kind of like PyTorch or TensorFlow graphs into ZK circuits. Um, you can then <laughs> run proofs on those graphs. Uh, you can, I'll get into the more detail about that in a bit. Um, but you can submit those proofs on chain, you know, execute some logic in a smart contract as a result of verifying that proof, all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, so in the back end, we're using Halo 2. Uh, which is actually a joint venture between Electric Coin Company and Protocol Labs. So also repping the Protocol Lab stack here. Um, <laughs> a big problem with ZK circuits and a big challenge when you're shoving data through them is that uh, they only operate on fields of integers. So if you have a bunch of floating point stuff, you have to quantize it. You have to do all sorts of complicated stuff in terms of customizing circuit gates. This command line tool handles it all for you. So let's say you have, <laughs> you know, classic setup for setting up a PyTorch model. You have a forward function, which is a bunch of complicated operations. It can act on a whole host of inputs. If you like matrix multiplication, we support that. If you like nonlinearities like ReLU and Sigmoid, we support that. If you like neural network layers like convolutional networks and dense layers, we also support that. Um, and you can turn all of that into a zero knowledge circuit and you can Basically, if you save this as in what's called an Onyx file, which is just uh, sort of like universal representation of what neural networks or computational graphs look like, it's compatible with a whole host of languages. Like, uh, you know, there's Rust TensorFlow supports loading these sorts of things, uh, Python, whatever. And you can use this basically to, to prove claims like, Let's say you have a private model and there's a bunch of public data. You can say, I ran my model on this public data and I achieved X percent accuracy. Or let's say you have private data but a public model. You can say, I ran this public model on my private data and I produced this output. Or you can just prove that you ran you know, a computation correctly. So it's kind of got interesting applications for trustless and distributed compute when you're dispatching compute jobs to lots of different nodes. Um, and this is just how simple the command line is. <laughs> uh, but yeah, in terms of performance, you know, we were able to put a three-layer convolutional network. That's a pretty big model, actually, uh, with private data input and assuming uh, private model parameters. And we're able to generate a proof in 400 seconds flat and only using 35 gigabytes of RAM. <laughs> so that seems really, really bad, but we haven't used some of the uh, sort of like proverbial hammers in our arsenal that Halo 2 provides, like recursion and lookup table fusion. So hopefully next time I'm talking, these numbers are much, much better. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot for that talk. It was really entertaining. <laughs> um, I had some questions about the performance numbers you quoted um, with your various graph sync impl implementations. Uh, yeah. Um, so does that depend on the like piece size when you're splitting the file delivery up? And yeah, like so it, it can vary by chunk size. So again, th these numbers were sort of homogenized over like different chunking sizes and those sorts of things. But yeah, we can, if you're interested in seeing the variation of these things by chunk size. Love to look at some more data. Yeah, yeah. come, uh, come hang out. Just quick follow up, <laughs> were, there, were there payments going on at the same time when yeah. you were running that as well? Uh, are, am I what? W w for those numbers you quoted, were you running payments as well? Like you oh, no, 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 no payments. Okay. That's, yeah, that's a whole other story, gotcha. much slower. Thank you. <laughs> and we need better payment channels. Shout out Magmo. <laughs> So in a peer-to-peer -peer data transfer, you first have to go through the peer discovery process. Yes. Did that have a significant impact on your time to first byte? And if so, what were some of the things you tried to make well, your time to first byte as small as possible? 
Yeah, I mean, I, that's one of the reasons we were leveraging Cloudflare to begin with, just because that reduced the time to first byte significantly. If you're going for like uh, completely sort of decentralized peer discovery, you're using things like Gossip or a DHT um, for querying which peers are where and have what, um, and that gets, yeah, it's just not scalable. So, I mean, the next best thing is basically replacing Cloudflare with like the indexers that I mentioned, where people are responsible, replace Cloudflare, are running nodes and are responsible for determining who has what in, in that sort of system. And this is something that old networks like Nutella and some other torrenting networks did uh, to, to great effect. So we've heard about station already today. And we, as you say, we've also heard that Juan said, don't mix up retrieval and compute. <laughs> but can you em envision any sort of use case of this zero knowledge proof of computation with station, with like edge compute, something, yeah, something sure. in that space? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, a key role of, I mean, a key function of certain CDNs is to be able to execute certain functions and transform data as close as possible to the end user. Um, so using something like this, where you know you don't have to trust that the operator is running your computation correctly, um, is actually kind of cool. Obviously, there's scalability issues with zk snark, so operations that would run, you know, very quickly in a in a fully trusted setting, uh, it don't <laughs> anymore. But yeah, it's a it's a good stepping stone towards doing that for sure. And yeah, there's very succinct ways of like representing computations. You can content address like circuits or computational graphs and just share them around using the, the stack that we already have.